Hello, Animator here. I haven't done a Q&A video for quite some time now, so I've collected a bunch of uh, questions from you guys down in the comment section, and I'm gonna answer them in this video. So let's get right to it. Amazing work, well done, thank you. Will there be other videos with the two female Givers? I ask of you, pure curiosity. For now, no, just because there's a bunch of videos that's on queue at the moment. Videos like the two Giver battle scenes and the last brawl requires more planning to do and took months to finish simply because the difficulty and complexity in filming those type of scenes. So uh, while there will be more uh, videos that is more ambitious, just like the ones that are uh, seen in Giver and the last brawl, um, unless there is a huge demand from the community that requests either Giver or some other figures, um, nothing is confirmed yet. So I hope that answers your question for now. Now, a lot of you guys out there ask where I got Bodycoon and how much did I got him from and where can you get one yourself? I got Bodycoon and Bodychan together as a set. Uh, this was some years ago before the creation of the channel about 90 US dollars before shipping. And this was years ago from a guy who no longer likes to use it for uh, drawing practice. And when he moved away from uh, the drawing illustrator hobby, he decided to sell it. And this was on a website like uh, Gumtree. I think it is Gumtree. It's been a while, so I don't remember. And I don't like keep a record of that. To be honest, this was before the channel was created. So honestly, I don't remember. I don't know other place that sells them officially because they are limited release, I believe. I know there are no shortage of bootlegs and fakes out there. If you do see one that's on sale or, or the ones that people are letting go, look at the pictures carefully and look at the seller's reputation because honestly, that's how I did it though. I didn't uh bought it from a from like a like an official vendor i bought it from a guy who no longer likes to do drawing has a hobby so i hope that answers your question all right next question how did you get the dents in the box uh i can't imagine you punch them in for such a small space and this comment uh is from the giver video the dents in the box from the giver video was a series of trial and error to be honest i would take boxes and try to poke holes with them uh let me just demonstrate real quick all right so i would take boxes like these and then just try them out um well first i did actually try i didn't record it i did took boxes like these and then punch them in uh, it didn't look very good, so I decided to uh, use my thumb or the size of uh, the Giver figures. Like, I would literally take uh, one of their feet or their hands and just, just mark it down and try to press it and look at what type of impression they make on the material itself and then further press it in, just like so. And I don't know if you can see it. So just by pressing my hands like this, there's the small little dent like that. So that's how I make those. But for the larger dents, I will take blades. So I would literally create like a circle and then keep pressing them in. So you kind of see there is like shadows and, and really subtle edges that uh, would suggest that is a larger impact or a more stronger impact, if that makes sense. And for more difficult positions, I would take something like a screwdriver and just poke them in and see if uh, I could make something similar or a similar impression that would uh, leave a mark on the box. I want to ask how many frames do you use and how little movement Please subscribe and like, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Trigger M. Hello, future animator here. I'm refilming this portion of the Q&A because I gave a long-winded and unrelated answer. So the frames, the total frames that I used during the, the end of production is this much. 
But over the course of uh, the video during uh, post-production, I've added and discarded some additional frames. So the final number is closer to 5,000 plus. If at any point you're curious if I do plan for how many frames that I use in uh, the Gaiva video or any video, I do try to estimate or guesstimate how many frames I'm generally going to uh, film just so I can uh, plan for a schedule for that scene or for that day, sometimes even for that week. I hope that answers your question. All right, here's a big one. There's a lot of you that ask in detail how to make the saya or the scabbard in the how to make your paper katana video. In retrospect, I didn't really explain very well in the video. So here's a video that explains how I did it. Here are three ways to make a miniature paper saya or scabbard for your mini paper katana. The first method is the one that I use in a video where the saya is made out of four strip of the finished pieces profile. It is as simple as taking the finished piece after the final press and trace the side profile by cutting or tear it out as well as the length of the piece by cutting or tear it out minus the tank while giving additional space for the piece to adhere to during assembly. After having all four strips of both sides profile as well as the length for top and bottom, simply just assemble and glue them together. Now it is important for both length pieces of the saya to have enough material to stick to both sides of profile strip to encase the finished piece. Once you've glued all four strips and encased the full length of the blade, you have made the saya with the first method. But if this isn't the look that you're going for and it's difficult for you, go ahead and try the second method. And the second method is similar to the first method, where the only difference is instead of using four small pieces that covers all sides of the finished piece, the second method only involves two large pieces of the same length to encase the full length of the blade. And just like the first method, trace both side profile, but instead of cutting as is, you'll need to leave out some give for points of contact for a material to glue during assembly. Once you have cut this out, Simply shape the outline with your fingers to make out the contour by using the trace that you have done as a guide. Even though there is no glue in this process yet, you can still take advantage of the flexibility of the material and create impressions of the finished piece. And when you're happy with the contour for both pieces that you have made, assemble both pieces and align it. If you're satisfied with what you have made, you can proceed to glue the contact points as seen on screen. After letting it set and cure, you finish making a saya with the second method. But if you don't like this look and want to create a more flush and seamless look to your saya, check out the third and last method. The last method to make a paper saya with curvature is only able to be done from scratch. I'll explain why. This method allows you to shape the saya's curvature along with the piece after applying PVA glue to the material. As you reach the stage where the piece is still flexible and malleable to shape, Apply another layer of the same material onto the same piece for the saya without the PVA glue so that it is removable later. At this point, you can decide on the thickness of the saya by wrapping additional layers. Just bear in mind that the more layers you do, the thicker it will appear from the piece. I recommend one layer for a more subtle curvature and two, maybe three layers for less subtle ones. After deciding how many layers you want for your saya, make sure you can remove and reinsert it back as it may pose a problem later down the line. If everything looks good, go ahead and reinsert it back into the saya and begin to shape the piece along with its saya intact. If you're happy with what you got, go ahead and remove and reinsert the saya back to make sure it's functional. You can cover the tip of the saya with the same material at any point, but for this demonstration, I'll just leave it be. If you're satisfied with the curvature of the piece along with its saya, remove the saya or scabbard and place it aside where you will remember for it to set and cure. You can proceed normally by doing the last press for the piece without its saya. When both the piece and its saya is hardened and cured, you can reinsert the saya back into the original piece. This method will give you a more flush look, but it is only able to be done from scratch but you can make one for an existing piece by making another piece with the same curvature or shape just to create the saya using this method. Now you manage to finish making the saya or mini scabbard for your mini katana. The last step is to remove the finished piece and hold the scabbard between your fingers like so, like your imaginary lighter and go ahead and smoke. Hold up, wait a minute. Regardless which method you choose to do or prefer, these are three alternative methods I would use to make the paper saya. 
Each method will result a different look and texture. So keep in mind as you make them yourself. This, I can't do how can paper bend? Like how is that supposed to make sense? Um, and there's the similar comment here that says, how did you curve the blade without any folds? Uh, good question. The paper can be bent, shape, or curve or sculpt by hand uh, when the glue, the wet glue has been applied to the material. In this case, is the paper, a regular paper. And as explained in the video, it is a technique that is very commonly used in origami, which I didn't know at the time, to achieve a very specific look. So when it's wet, you can hand sculpt it or shape it or curve it to a very specific look to how you want it. And if you let it cure, set and dry, it, it would retain its shape. So it be, it will become whatever shape that you sculpt, curve, shaped it uh, with. Trey asks, can you make armor? And also another comment that's similar that says, I love this tutorial. I would love to learn a uh, node and learn how you make paper miniatures, armor slash armor. Um, yes, I do plan to make an armor out of paper at some point. It is an idea that has been sitting in my head rent free for the past few months while I was making the Giver video. So that is in the works at the moment. Uh, but I'm making other videos right now. But in the meantime, though, remember to ding the notification if you haven't yet. So when the video eventually drops, you won't miss it. This comment asks, what editor do you use? I use Final Cut Pro or Final Cut Pro X or Final Cut Pro 10. I like how halfway through the animation got a lot better. Learn a thing or two while making this video, eh? Yeah, making these videos is a practice every single time. So I would hope that it gets better progressively. Uh, and thank you for watching. Cardinal Polo asks, brother, I have a question for you about lights. Sometimes I, the pick goes too dark too clearly. Any advice on this issue? Thanks. Um, this can happen for various reasons. Uh, first, it can happen because of the power source. Electricity sometimes fluctuate, maybe in your area it does. I know in my area, sometimes it does and can cause a brownout. You might not catch it with a naked eye, but your camera or your capturing device might. So that could be uh, one. Another reason it could be because of your equipment. Some lights like uh, non-LED lights sometimes can flicker just because um, the nature of the, the hardware itself, or some, if it's an old bub or an old equipment, especially faulty LEDs, it might happen. Um, so try a different light source and see if that helps. And also if you're filming with an open window, especially during daylights, if you're using natural lights, uh, that could be your reason that your image goes from light to dark or dark to light, uh, vice versa. I also heard it could be the issue with the lens in your camera. Uh, if you're using a device with um, a detachable lens, especially um, camera like the ones that I'm using now, a DSLR with a detachable lens. I cannot confirm if this is the case, but I've seen sometimes people changing to a different lens sometimes work, or it's just maybe because the camera itself, the capturing device that you're using uh, sometimes have the shutter open a little too long, which absorbs light or captures light a little bit longer than usual. So that could be the cause as well. And the last cause I can think of, or could be the problem is the software. It could be inside the camera or the, a separate, um, device. Like if you're attaching it to a computer or something, if you're filming it on your phone, maybe the app is glitchy and buggy. I'm not saying the software that you use to film has bugs, but it's very difficult not to rule out that possibilities. And if this reoccurs uh, consistently, you might want to reinstall your app or software or try to use an alternative software if the option is available to you. Um, that's what I will do if it happened to me, which it does, but I usually fix it in post-production uh, because that is a problem that I face as well. Could we get a collection tour? 
It is a mess right now. Maybe one day. Yo, how did you do the teleportation effect? And another comment that says, this is way too underrated. May I ask, how did you make the blurring effect on both characters? It looks really good. I'm guessing the blur or teleportation effect refers to the directional blur that I did. If it is, I did this effect in Final Cut Pro 10 or Final Cut Pro X with the mask tool to isolate the layers that I want to blur uh, the layers with and apply the directional blur plugin onto the mask layer. And then I just increase or decrease the level of blur that I want to make. Please make more of this. Okay. Okay. Chris asks, is that Mei Raiden from Honkai series? Um, that is Mitsurugi Meya from the Move Louvre series. Am I pronouncing it right? I'm not sure. But he's referring to this video. Great tutorial. Where did you buy the stop motion rig that you use? And another one asks, can you make a video on what rigs you use for your characters and where did you got it from? What kind of stop motion rig do you use for your project? Uh, this rig is actually a soldering stand. I just added um, like a black material here. This is a, I think a hair tie that I put on top of it. So during uh, post-production, it's easier to remove it because normally the background is black in my videos. Um, I purchased this rig uh, from a hardware store where they sell those soldering clamp stands or like those soldering iron type of stores. Usually hardware store sells them. Um, I also use the stand that comes in the figure like Figma stands like these ones. I mainly use two of this stand for all, all of my videos to be honest. So if I can do it, you can too. Where do you buy these all original figurines? Uh, I already answered this question in the comments, but I still do get this question from time to time. I purchase figurines, some figurines on eBay, Amazon, uh, Gumtree, um, Carousel. I'm not sure if it's available in your area, uh, but I always vet the seller's profile if it's not like a huge vendor. Uh, even if it's a huge vendor, check out the profile, um, ask for images and things like that. And I stay away from any sellers that use um, stock images unless I know for a fact they are official, like Ami Ami. Sometimes though, I do use uh, proxy sites like Zen Market to purchase figurines from Japan on uh, to my address. Uh, this isn't anyway sponsored by Zen Market, um, though I wish I was. Zen Market, if you're listening, you know what to do. I just started stop motion and I want to order one. Can I get it to ship to South Africa? Uh, this was posted about nine months ago. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know. You are going to need to check every website or e-merchant if they ship to your address. This comment is quite recent. Uh, you tried putting a thin layer of super glue on the loose joint after they pop out and one waiting for them to dry before putting them back in tightening them. I think what this comment is referring to is have I done modification like applying super glue to the Figma joints? See, the problem with modifying figurines or uh, this Figma Giver is it isn't fair for somebody who is considering to purchase or somebody who already have them. As mentioned in the animators review video, I wanted to review Figma Giver in its out of the box state instead of a irreversible uh, modified state. The video is meant to highlight the figure and also to address to some degree the flaws of the figure themselves to show what on what condition and setting it would look good uh, for those who might already own them and also for those who are considering if they should get it themselves, which is why I don't do any irreversible modifications on the figures that is featured on the channel. Last question for this video, Toasted Tyler asks, what's the stand you use for the figure and what's the phone holder you use? Um, for the stand that I usually use, uh, let me just grab them here. I use mainly the Figma stand that normally comes with Figma and also this soldering stand that I slightly modified with the 
with my hair tie um, that I use for all my videos, to be honest. And um, for the phone holder, mainly for the iPhone itself, uh, I already addressed it in my guide video. Um, it's called Beast Grip Pro, but I use a third party ones. I think it's from the same mold, just from a different company because it's a third party ones. So I guess it's not as good as the Beast Grip Pro, but it still does its job. So yeah, all right. That's it from me for now. I want to thank those of you who commented down in any of the videos, ask, asking questions, uh, give encouraging words, uh, as well as those who DM me in uh, on Instagram. And for those of you who are asking, where can you support me? Uh, I left the link down in the description of my Patreon page. I recently create them. Right now, I'm currently um, putting in all pictures and uh, old thumbnails for those who uh, genuinely want to support me and the channel if you want to and you can. Um, that's down in the description. But for now, until then, I will see you in the next video. Bye.